In 1989, the neighborhood of Ash Street in Tacoma, Washington was an open-air drug market. There were several hot spots and almost every house on the block was an active and thriving trap house. These gang infestations in the 1980s, born from the crack epidemic, flooded the streets and created an economic downturn that defined the decade. You might remember President Ronald Reagan declaring the war on drugs. Or his first lady who was just like, just say no, oh my god. That, well, that was this time. Tacoma was Washington State's ground zero of gang activity. And by the summer of 1989, it had grown blatant, middle of the day type shit. Like selling crack to the ice cream man type shit. And this was all fueled by an influx of gang members moving in from California. Tacoma police had experienced nothing like it before and were really struggling to get it under control. Oftentimes not even knowing how to respond to it. Ash Street neighbors consistently called police and called 911 repeatedly and got nowhere. The typical response from police at the time was very mild. Community-oriented policing was a new thing, such as taking bullshit calls and pretending like it's not bullshit. Yes, ma'am. I know you can't sleep when the dogs are barking. But community policing was still viewed with suspicion by veteran cops who came up in the 60s and preferred the old ways, like smacking people in the head with their portable radios. At the time, Tacoma Police Chief Ray Faitlin pushed these new community policing programs so far that the Hilltop Crip Gang rose to power. When the OGs from Westbrook like HTC we mounted up the streets 200 deep when the park ladies had a shootout with cats from Ash when the Ashes connected with them Hilltop niggas had a shootout and chased out from Cali Staff Sergeant William Folk of the 2nd Ranger Battalion 75th Ranger Regiment purchased his home on Ash Street in hopes that the neighborhood would soon turn around. To protect that investment, he was determined to help push the drugs and gangs out by any means necessary. Which may seem crazy to most people, but Staff Sergeant Folk was not most people. He was an elite operator who at a moment's notice could hit hard and smash fucking everything. You know, Ranger shit. But violence was the last thing the Staff Sergeant wanted, and he remained optimistic. In the summer of 1989, Folk returned from a December deployment in Panama to find the neighborhood worse than when he left. Along with other neighbors who were honest, hardworking people, he formed a neighborhood group that pressed police, demanding action. The neighbors started making signs, protesting, and taking pictures of the drug dealers. Even as the tension on Ash Street rose, Chief Faitlin made a decision he would later regret. Hamstrung by budget constraints and desperately short on the patrol side, he shifted four of six officers away from the Hilltop Crime Management Team to launch a community policing pilot project. The neighbors on Ash Street reacted with dismay. Under fire from citizens and the city council, a local tribune covered the controversy, noting efforts by Ash Street neighbors to monitor the drug activity themselves. After the News Tribune piece, drug traffic on Ash Street slowed, but only so much. Staff Sergeant Folk was used to seeing more than 100 cars pass through his block on any given day, and after the story appeared, it was down to 20 cars. Folk decided to install a video camera on his upstairs window to record the traffic. He organized a neighborhood barbecue as a show of public unity set for 3 p.m. Saturday, September 23rd. He invited neighbors, friends, ranger buddies, and thought nothing more of it. The day of the barbecue, a group of Hilltop Crip gangbangers acknowledged Folk outside of his residence and gave him the gun finger. It came from a car full of Crips. Driving by his house, the index finger pointed, thumb up, a little flip of the hand, and the mouth words, boom, boom. The gangsters saw the video camera on Folk's house, and a few hours later they returned and threw rocks at it. Someone else took shots at the house and the video camera with a BB gun. Folk and a few ranger buddies then walked across the street to confront the out-of-shape chain-smoking gangbangers who think they're hard. Folk told them to stop throwing things at his home and the neighbors' homes, to stop shooting BBs, and to instead turn their lives around and find better ways. The gangbangers warned him to take the camera out of his window. The gangbangers suggested the staff sergeant didn't know who he was dealing with. The staff sergeant suggested the gangbangers didn't know who they were dealing with. They then told him, your history, bitch, and told him they were gonna burn his house down and light him up as soon as the sun goes down. Folk decided to walk away, and before he returned to his home, he overheard one of the crypts stating, I'm gonna shoot that army son of a bitch. Folk then walked inside his house, he picked up his telephone, called some more of his ranger buddies from the 2nd Ranger Battalion, and invited them over for a barbecue, suggesting it wouldn't hurt if they came armed. 
translation, bring your own bullets. Hey guys, let's have a barbecue. Okay, well, yeah, what are we gonna smoke? Just some Crips. Including the few rangers who were already at the barbecue and the rangers called, the total of rangers grew to 15. Folk told them to bring personal weapons and whatever else they had. They came armed to the teeth with handguns, shotguns, and rifles. Folk was armed with a Browning 9mm and a Colt Python 357 Magnum. Fucking Magnum. Who's who's the gangster now, bitch? Over a couple beers, Folk pitched to his buddies a defensive operation of his home. Stake out locations and wait. No first moves. If police come, disarm immediately, cooperate, and assist. And all of his buddies joyfully agreed and were fucking down. They thought maybe nothing will happen, but if it does, zero tolerance for dudes shooting gats and smoking Swisher Sweets. As the sun went down, the rangers dispersed into their defensive positions, alert and observant of any and all activity inside and outside the perimeter of the house. A few hours had passed as the rangers held their positions. One ranger observed a vehicle approaching in the distance at a slow rate of speed, at which point the vehicle shut off its headlights. Folk with his magnum in hand returned the favor and turned out the lights in his house and in the yard. At 9.20 p.m., as the vehicle approached, someone within the vehicle fired a shot into the air. The house was now taking fire from the rear, where according to police reports, small caliber automatic gunfire was heard. The Rangers opened a shit ton of fire but so did the Hilltop Crips. One of the Rangers, William Edwards, was posted on the front porch. When the shooting started, he hit the ground as a bullet slammed into the wall beside him. He and other Rangers returned fire, seeing figures running amongst parked cars on the other side of the street. Ranger Russell Nolte, posted in the backyard, crawled forward as a shot hit the back of the house three feet over his head. Ranger Burr Settles was posted upstairs by the infamous controversial fucking video camera as a shot came through the window. The bullet grazed his head and he received multiple lacerations on his face from the shattered glass. Numerous muzzle flashes were now seen from the east. There were at least 16 shooters in three different locations. The Rangers again returned fire while outside the assailants took cover amongst the parked cars, shooting over their shoulders, ducking down, shooting blindly you know, stupid shit like that, like gangsters do. At this time, a neighbor taking cover on her kitchen floor dialed 911. And just like the famous Wild West shootout at the OK Corral, it was over in minutes, 10 minutes to be exact. The first police car came down the middle of the street, cherries and berries on, with his siren blaring. The Rangers dropped their weapons, but as that first patrol car arrived on scene, one of the Hilltop Crip gang members popped a round off, sending the patrol car reversing out of the scene so quickly, smoke was seen coming from the rear tires. Officers in the car reported hearing 50 to 60 shots in less than one minute. Shortly after, more cops pulled into the block and the gangbangers ran. The unarmed staff sergeant walked out the back door to his driveway and the alley behind his house. He felt someone behind and didn't fight. A hand shoved his head down and a voice ordered him to the ground. One gang member by the name of Frankie Strickland was cornered by a police canine and found to be in possession of 16 rounds of 9mm. He said he was holding them for a friend but couldn't remember the friend's name. You know, like a fucking liar. He also said the same thing about the pistol he was carrying. It was for, it was for a friend. Another suspect was carrying copper-headed rounds for a gas gun. Once the situation was under control and the officers learned about the ranger's defensive operation, the responding sergeant of the Tacoma Police Department wasn't too happy about it. He lectured Folk and the other rangers for not calling the police for assistance until shots were fired felt that the situation may have been avoided by calling 911 prior to the shooting getting started. Out of what was quite possibly a 35-man gunfight with over 300 rounds shot in the dark, no one was reported to be killed or injured. For 20 years, the official version of the shootout held that miraculously no one was hurt, but there are rumors injured gang members did not seek medical attention for obvious reasons, and some may have even been mortally wounded. And according to Folk himself, during the firefight, one gang member rushed towards Folk's house. I guess he thought he was gonna John Wayne it. 
Folk remembered. One of the rangers took aim and hit the gangster in the shoulder. The attacker staggered back and ran away. The moment goes unmentioned in police reports and witness accounts of the time. Unverified gossip holds that the wounded man was treated at a Seattle area hospital over an hour away from Tacoma. Doug Sutherland, who was mayor at the time, pondered a declaration of a citywide version of martial law to combat the gang violence that immediately drew national attention. The city of Tacoma found the dollars to add more police officers to their department. Then Governor Booth Gardner even considered sending in the National Guard to Ash Street. The Hilltop Crip gang member who was arrested and found in possession of the 9 mil and the pistol, Frankie Strickland, was the only man charged in connection with the shootout. He was convicted of second degree assault and was later sentenced to 22 months in prison. Bruh. The military officially considered the incident a matter of self-defense for the off-duty rangers. On February 9th, 2010, Tacoma police and FBI launched a major crackdown on the Hilltop Crip gang and charged 32 members with up to 50 crimes, everything from theft to attempted murder and drug sales. A few years back, a Tacoma police officer said something about the shootout. He said it was the single most important incident in Tacoma that caused a change in police policies and practices. Staff Sergeant William Folk never moved away from Ash Street, and as he predicted, he was never promoted and left the army in 1993. He still owns the property to this day. Hey guys, if you enjoyed